Reverend Steve DeCall, a longtime friend who teaches at uh, St. Mary's College in South Bend. And he asked me if I wanted to do an exhibition. And at that time, um, one thing that was sort of on my mind was my mother. Uh, my mom had Alzheimer's and for about 15 years, and she was near the end of her life last summer. So I knew she would be, she would die before the, before this year. So I uh, proposed to an exhibition that be a kind of memorial to her. Um, so when I had that idea, immediately I started thinking about the large painting that's in the gallery. It's a painting of a woman sitting by water. And you'll have, if you haven't seen the show, you'll have to imagine it and go see it in the gallery uh, today. Uh, when I was making that painting, it's a 16 foot wide painting, I at one point had written on the ground in the dirt, la mer, la mer, which is the French for the mother of the sea. I don't know exactly why I did that. I took French in high school and maybe I was just like uh, interested in the connection between the two, but that phrase came to mind. And almost immediately the idea of the show started expanding. Uh, I decided to include other artists. I work as a curator as well as an artist. A curator is someone who works in the gallery and decides what gets hung and how it gets hung. I, I work at North Park University in Chicago and run the gallery there. So I often curate shows, but this is the first time where I actually started inviting other artists to participate, participate in the exhibition. There are 20 artists participating in this exhibition in addition to myself. And um, so we did the show there, and about six months after Ian had contacted me, I got an email from Rob saying, would you like to have a show here? <laughs> I was like, well, I've got the perfect show. <clears throat> I mean, in part, the idea of the show, The Mother of the Sea, was related not simply to the passing of my mother, but Mary, the mother of Jesus, seemed like a logical idea for that context, and for this context as well. So the exhibition was there in September, and it came here in October. Um, but Coslino, the connection is when he gets here. Uh, he recently took the job as curator of painting at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. He was in Philadelphia before. And he has overseen the acquisition of several of my pieces from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So I, knowing that he has this particular interest, I thought it would be great to be able to get him to come down. He hit the traffic coming in, so I don't know how late it will be, hopefully it will be here soon. But let me start just by sort of giving a basic introduction to my work. Um, I know when he gets here, he'll have a more interesting uh, kind of collective slides, other artists work that he sees as related. So uh, I graduated from Calvin College in 1981, um, and uh, I had grown up in South Korea. My parents were medical missionaries. And that, that childhood growing up in what was then the third world country, that is a very devastated by the Korean War, left me with a certain kind of idea of what being a human and doing in the world was about. And basically it was like, you're here to do something for people. It wasn't about, I'm here to make money. So um, already from that point, from my youth, I was already thinking about how can artwork be doing something that's about giving agency to those who are dispossessed. That sounds like a strange way to put it, but that was part of what I was thinking about. And so I'll, I'm not going to show you any of the work I did immediately after school, but in 1985, our daughter Tema was born. Tema was born, and the uh, day after she was born, she had a cardiac arrest, she stopped breathing, and after she was revived, she had profound brain damage. Uh, if you looked at the exhibition, about half the work in the exhibition is related to my daughter, and there's a reason for that. My daughter, after her brain damage, we didn't know what, what it would be like, but um, essentially she cannot do anything that most of us can do. That is, she can't walk, she can't talk, she can't remember, uh, she can't see. And so for me to describe her as that is, is the way I would have described her uh, in 1985 after she was born. Now when I describe her, I describe her as, well, that's what she isn't. What she is is a profoundly meaningful human being. And only after a long time and slowly coming to understand who she is do we sort of start to tap into what and who she is. I'll give you an example. Do you, how many of you know an adult who is completely innocent? Raise your hand. I know one. I live with one. Completely innocent. 
Now that might seem, sound like, well, that's so what? That's actually kind of a superpower because most of us don't have the capacity or we, we, it's beyond us to be purely innocent. That's just one small way in which Tema sort of informs every day. I mean, for me, every day encountering and being with her is, is very disconcerting. <coughs> Kind of like, whoa, this does not you know, connect to the way I normally go with people. So that's, that's kind of an important way to, to start talking about my work, because much of my work is related to Tana. This is the first painting I made of her in 1985. Actually, I made this in 86. It was the first painting, it was almost a year after she was born. That, again, the experience was so devastating for us that it was really hard for me to think about making art related to her. So in the first painting I made of her, I made a painting that really is about loss. In the foreground, you see a Greek crater. That's like an ancient Greek vase. And on it is Nike, the goddess of victory. And it's been smashed. And so that's kind of a, a crude metaphor for sort of loss. Um, in the background is a burning stack of rice hulls. And on the, the left is a, a mourner from a photograph in, in um, a disaster in Korea. This is nothing like Korea, but I like the idea of using these sort of references from my past in terms of kind of symbols of the morning. Uh, it wasn't until much later, uh, looking at this painting, that I started thinking about, what does it look like she's doing? And it looks like she's lying down, but how else might we read her position? Any thoughts? Trying to roll over. Trying to roll over? I think the way I see it is informed by my dad telling me about a football player that played a, a, a team that, he went to college and played football. He said there was a running back in that team that when that running back ran, he ran as if he was falling forward. Like, that, that was like he was running so fast that he was falling forward. Kind of looks like that. It looks like she's actually running full speed. And there was a sense when, uh, before she uh, had the cardiac arrest, that she was just completely giving up. And the cardiac arrest was essentially like, I can't do this. Um, since that time, though, her, she has relentlessly cleaned to life. Um, so, now, as I said, I sort of had a predisposition for sort of a political kind of approach to thinking about art. In the 1980s, I don't know if you're aware of this, we were, as a nation, involved indirectly in some, some civil wars in Central America. And this piece is not specifically about one of those, but it's thinking about the nature of violence. The title of the piece is called Communicant. And in the piece, you have a soldier drinking the water tainted by the blood of the victim, which to me is a very kind of perverse analogy to the Eucharist in terms of eating the body and blood of Jesus. Um, somebody once said, what, when are you going to paint it, uh, a crucifixion? And I said, that, that's the closest I'm going to come to painting a crucifixion. Um, the board on the ground has I and RI. If you see a crucifixion, usually that's on the board above the cross. Um, so I'm showing this painting not because um, I, I'm very proud that this painting's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but it's really not a painting that I connect much with. Not in the politics I, I still would agree with, but it feels kind of like it's an idea. It's not something that I know. It's not something that comes out of my experience and direct understanding. It's more about sort of my political convictions. Um, now, much of the work I was doing in the 80s had this sort of what's called magic realism. Uh, magic realism in visual art is, is making images that look like they could be real, but have a dreamlike quality to them. So in this case, I was making, again, a piece that was sort of reflecting on, on life with my daughter. She's the one in the background in an inner tube. She can't actually crawl. That seemed like an interesting kind of metaphor. In the foreground is my wife. And when you look at paintings, pay attention. Because there are things happening in paintings that people take like completely for granted. For instance, in this painting, what do you notice about the light source? Is there a consistent light source here? So how many light sources are there? Two. There's a light source for the background, which is illuminating landscape, and then there's a light source for the figure in the foreground. And so that, that difference in the light source sort of separates them. It's as if she's in the foreground and perhaps this is her dream or her imagination. Uh, things like lighting or scale or 
touch, and a lot of different things in painting that carry meaning. It's wise to pay very careful attention. Uh, this painting is quite a bit later than the ones I just showed you. This is from 1999. It is about the size that it's, uh, it's like 12 feet. So it's about the same size as what you see on the screen here. Um, so when I, made, when I was thinking about making this painting, I was thinking about, um, I had a conversation with my dad, who had cancer, and uh, was thinking a lot about death, I think, and he said I should uh, make a sculpture of my daughter after the resurrection. And I frankly don't know what that would be. Um, but that got me thinking about, um, thinking about this idea, uh, particularly the, the Lord's Prayer, that, that phrase, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the title of the painting is Tema on Earth. This is what we have, this is what we know. And I think much of we, what we think, including those who are religious, what we think, uh, is rooted in our experience. And that's actually the nature of the incarnation. Jesus wasn't some sort of idea. He actually came here in the body and flesh. So anyway, I'm thinking about Tema, lying in ground, but I wanted to try something that uh, I wasn't aware of anybody doing, and I'm sure someone else has done this, but how many of you are familiar with that in one point, two point perspective? Okay, how many of you have stood on a railroad track and noticed how the lines of the railroad track converge to a point of distance? Have you ever noticed that? Or in this building, this is actually a rear room, so it's kind of hard to say it because the lines are all going different directions, but if you typically, if you stand in a place where there are lines, they, they go to a point, and that point, the point in a painting where those lines converge actually determines where you are in terms of how you're seeing the painting. This might not make sense, but actually that vanishing point places the viewer at a specific, one viewer at one place at one time. So the assumption of sort of traditional perspective is one person has seen this painting. Well, what is it to make a painting that isn't being seen by one person at one time? So when I made this painting, or when I was working on this, uh, I, Tim and I went out, found this place in, in the countryside. I didn't want something as tamed like a park. Um, and so we found this developer. And I put Lank in the ground, laid her on the ground. And I took my camera, and about this far above her, took a picture, stepped over, took another picture, stepped over, took another picture, took about 30 pictures, all of which were stake, taken straight down. How far away did you say you are from her? Venture guess. Five feet? Twenty feet? Thirty feet? Five feet? Five feet? Ten feet? For me, it looks like she's like twenty feet away. Uh, your, your eyes have stereoscopic vision, right? Your eyes can determine how far something is much easier if it's close than it's at a distance, right? Because that angle of your eyes is much, once it gets to a certain distance, it's hard to really assess how far something is from you. Uh, but as I said, I took the photographs from very close, but it's looking like it's far away because everything you're seeing there is being seen from straight in front. Typically, if I was standing here looking down at someone lying on the ground, I'd see the bottom of their chin and the top of their feet. Does that make sense? So you aren't seeing that way. You're not seeing it as if you're there. You're seeing it as if you're some you're nowhere. Like you're 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 over here, you're over there, you're all those places at the same time, which a human being can't be. In other words, this painting you're seeing the way a human can't see. Um, and I, I liked this idea in terms of how it sort of dislocates the viewer and puts them in this kind of strange relationship with, with the painting. Simultaneously, the figure in the painting is lying on the ground, but because it's on the wall, she's floating over top of you. So I, I like the way in which a simple image like this is actually doing a number of different things towards trying to get the viewer to sort of move somewhere, to sort of move in their thinking. And I can tell you, I've had all different kinds of responses to this painting. Like, who is that dead kid? Did she fall from the building? Uh, oh, she looks comfortable. And all different kinds of readings of the painting. And um, I like that. Um, yeah, I, as I implied earlier, my father had cancer and he was close to his life. And in some ways, I like this in conjunction with the one you just saw. The one you saw before is 8 by 12 feet. This is about 8 by 12 inches. So it's a very small painting. 
And it gets at an experience that is common. Some of you may have even experienced this with a grandparent or a parent, uh, where they're in the hospital towards the end of their life. And, uh, Usually when I do a slide presentation, I show about 30 slides. I'm going to be showing you many fewer than that, so it's kind of weird. <laughs> so I'm sort of trying to figure out, okay, how to fit this in. Uh, so this is a piece that was part of a series of paintings I made of my wife and daughter sitting on the couch in the early 90s. And uh, my wife's experience uh, in terms of Thomas cardiac arrest and all that was a much more difficult one. Me. I think she felt a lot of guilt, even though she, I didn't feel like she had any reason to feel guilty. But as a mother, I think she felt a sense of guilt and carried that with her. It wasn't until <clears> the <throat> time I became a teenager that Sherry, my wife, started sort of connecting with her as a companion as opposed to sort of a burden. And these, this painting comes from a series of paintings that really is about their relationship. In this case, again, I was using. I use photographs to make paintings, but I'm also interested in what happens when you play with that. So, for instance, in, in all these, this series, I was playing with photographic phenomena. How many of you have used an SLR camera where you can zoom the lens? Okay, when you zoom the lens while you're taking the photograph, it produces this kind of blur that where the thing sort of expands. So this is a photograph, based on a photograph using that kind of zoom in with the lens. <coughs> I wasn't so much interested in simply as, a, as an effect. I was interested in what happens in terms of how the child's head actually becomes almost as large as the mother in this sort of overlay. Uh, I don't know if you would have experienced anything like this, but I can, I can assure you that at some point in your life, if you are a parent, there's a sort of strangeness in terms of how the, how the child, their relationship with you. I mean, you, your own relationship with your parents, there's kind of a constant changing, right? A kind of a whole way. <coughs> All right. This is a piece that is, um, and I didn't say this earlier, but if you have questions, I would really be happy if you just holler out. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. It's not interrupting, I'm just participating in the discussion. <coughs> so, uh, the piece that's in the library, which I've not put into this, is one of a number of pieces I've made in the last 12, 15 years that are collaborative works. Uh, I hope you have a chance. Have you looked, have you all seen this painting that's in the library? Have you looked at it up close? Because when you see that painting from a distance, it looks like an isolated figure in a dark field. If you get up close to that piece, within a few feet, you start to notice that the background is not <coughs> It's actually a dark gray and it's covered by hundreds of thousands of dots. Every time I show that, if there's an opportunity, people work with me and we paint dots on that back background. So far, over 100 people have worked with me on it. And the painting of the dots is done um, very specifically. You, you, you paint dots wherever, but the dots have to be as close to each other as possible, and you have to count them. And why? Well, if you do that, the resulting dots look very intentionally painted. They're not randomly painted. And so when you have this, when you, the viewer looking at it has the sense that whoever did this cared about it. It was done carefully. Uh, but, um, so I'd invite you to take a look closely at that, because that is an example of a kind of participatory, collaborative work that I've done. This is another one. I had this, this dream about being carried by some people, and I sort of extrapolated from that dream to thinking of making a, a painting where people are carrying a tema. And this was a small advanced drawing class I had, and I said, would you guys be interested in participating in making a drawing? And so they helped by holding her, posing, and then uh, they helped me with the initial drawing. Uh, it's about Actually, it's probably a little bit bigger than what you see here. It's nine feet tall. Uh, it's called Curie. There was a doctor who's also a writer who wrote about this piece, and he talked about how one thing he's noticed as a doctor is that uh, those who are sort of in need uh, somehow create a community. Uh, so in the case where we have Tema, you have these people who are carrying their, 
they are, in a sense, made, in a made into a community by virtue of their care for her. Does that understand what I mean by that? Um, the other thing that's sort of curious about this is how uh, they are in some way disembodied, right? All you see is their head and their shoulders, whereas her body is presented to you sort of in its entirety. So it, to me, it's a kind of interesting thing. And it actually is manifested in terms of uh, people who have cared for, for Tana. I, I really want to emphasize, I'm talking about a very specific experience, my own experience, and the experience with my daughter Tana and my wife. I don't mean to, by making so much art related to Tema, I don't mean to somehow put on a plateau and just to say, pay attention. And there's Bob Cosolino. He just walked in. Thank you. Hello. He just drove down from Minneapolis. I just drove up from Chicago. So we are two very yeah, nice. Thank you, Rice. Hi, Tim. Do you have your power point? I do. Okay, so if you want to put it on. I'll try on this. So yes, everything that went wrong with my drive that could have gone wrong, um, except for crashing, I didn't crash, but there was a crash. And then my car overheated, so. Oh. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> it happens to the most important people, friends. Uh, I know what that is. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been just talking sort of generally about my work. Sure. And, uh, so one of the things Tim wanted me to, to talk about a little bit was um, the lineage that I see for the work that he does. Um, so the, the slides that I added to Tim's PowerPoint all have to do with other artists in the 20th century and a couple generations before him who um, considered themselves modern artists but instead of um, going abstract or using abstraction, uh, as in this Willem de Kooning painting, as the way of expressing what they thought was modern art, or expressing what they, they thought about um, what it is to be alive and human in the 20th century, uh, with all the kinds of turmoil and the different challenges that happened, um, they decided that the body uh, was the, the vessel that they really felt was most meaningful. And so, they also thought that they would express that through the way that they were interacting and understanding the, the life and times around them. So an artist like Ivan Albright, whose painting is here on the right, um, who was born in 1897, he's somebody who ex he experienced the trauma of World War I. He was a medical illustrator in front. Um, and when he went to paint the body, even though he was very much interested in modern art, abstraction, what the capacity of abstraction was to mean, it was the body that, to him, was the most meaningful symbol and, and vessel for lots of different kinds of human experience. And so when, when he turned to that, instead of duplicating Christian iconography, instead of sort of taking that and making new religious paintings, what Albright did is he looked at that as a model. So you're looking at, on the left, a painting from um, the, the 14th or 15th century, made in, in Germany, basically, by an artist named Master Franca, who's probably actually a, a monk. Um, and it's Christ as the man of sorrow bearing his wounds. That's supposed to be a meditative image to look at. And whether you're a believer or not, it's an image that, that's meant to look for you to look at it and think about sacrifice, think about pain, and, and empathize with it. So rather than use Christ, for instance, as a, as a symbol, Ivan Albright was turning to his neighbors in Warrenville, Illinois, and thinking about ordinary people as exemplary sufferers, or as people for whom their experience was written on the body. So I see Tim as doing that in some ways through the work that he does uh, with his own sort of self-portraiture, but also with his family. Um, so the other thing, just in case you haven't been exposed to this kind of material that I, I'd like to stress is that there is a whole tradition in modern art, uh, in 20th century and into 21st century art, of using earlier art that was rooted in spirituality and Christianity, sometimes commissioned, um, as the basis or the model for dealing with American human life and experience. And that's still something that people are doing today. But it's not really something that often gets taught 
in parallel with abstraction in 20th century art. So this is on a red share, um, which is a tribute to the American working people. It's a tribute to laborers uh, in the early, um, of the late 1940s. Um, and George Tooker is somebody that, this is a self-portrait by him, that Tim has talked about as, as an influence. Tooker was known for painting these, these images of New York in the 1950s that were like the epitome of, of anxiety in Cold War America. Cold War America. But later in life, Tooker started to integrate spiritual themes without actually making them religious. So this is a painting that's supposed to be an homage to Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who Tooker met uh, in the early 60s. But it sort of echoes this, the iconography of the Supper at Emmaus when Jesus comes back and appears to two people who take him in and give him um, uh, a meal. And then um, later, Tooker does convert to Catholicism and does paint some, not only church commissions, but it, it, it's sort of in everything he does. Um, these are stations of the cross that he did. So, um, you know, there's this whole tradition in, in modern art of that. And I, I see Tim is, is following in line with that. Um, so, there you go. Yeah. But the other thing I want to talk to Tim about is um, this idea of collaboration. Because the show in the gallery here is a collaboration uh, with, with other people that are important to, to Tim. He's done a collaborative work in the past. Uh, even a physical object made is a collaborative work that he starts. And also, you've talked about your work with your, with your daughter as a model, right. really as a collaboration. So yeah. I wonder if you could talk about the nature of that a bit. Well, I, I, I have been talking with them some about Tama. Um, the part of the part of what I was alluding to early on, I, I showed the, the, the early piece is not about how the early work was really about loss. But as time has gone on, uh, the, the nature of the collaboration is quite different from the typical collaboration because she has no, um, she has very little agency. Why am I using the word agency that's here? You, you, you all have agency. You're here, you're, built, you're able to walk, you're able to talk, you're able to do different, different things, right? That is, have agency. So, Tama's really not able to do much for herself. So when the, the, the collaborative nature of her participation is through being, not through doing. And so, um, yeah, I see her actually as my chief collaborator. Now, if you asked her, she, she would have an idea what that was. Uh, so, cl typically collaboration is both parties sort of equally participating. The nature of my collaboration with Tony is a much more, uh, perhaps one-sided, I don't know, it's hard, hard to say. But. Does Tema react to the, the work that you do and you show she's her? She's mm -hmm. So, and she's not able to remember so she can't learn. So, and, and imagine that everything you're seeing right now, you've never seen anything before. You wouldn't understand anything in front of your eyes. It sounds horrible, but it also would be utterly magical. If everything in front of you, you had never seen, you'd be like, whoa, what is this, right? So the sense I have with Tim is that she sort of lives in that state of constant wonder. Uh, I, I showed this in talks about this. Yeah. What about F25? You talked about this one. No, and, yeah, I didn't say something just showing up in my room. Yeah, so this is a piece called F25 that uh, was prompted by Tennis' 21st birthday. 25th birthday. Yeah, and um, so it's an object. So it's something, it, when it's installed, this panel stands on a plinth. And so you're seeing one side on the right and then the other side, so it's the back of that on the left. The panel is made by an artisan who, who is a woodworker who lives in St. Paul. And then Tim painted the portrait. No. No, you didn't paint the portrait. No. All the pieces are a contrib contribution. 25 time. pieces. Okay. Each piece was painted by <coughs> one or two artists. There are three yards in full size blocks, but they're like this size to this size. And I sent a corresponding piece of the photograph that I had taken, exactly the same size as the block. And this is the insane part. Most of these people are oil painters. I sent them black and white acrylic, which if you're an oil painter, you know that's hell to work with. And I said, please replicate this as stylistically neutrally as possible. That is totally insulting to an artist because you basically deprive them of the one thing they're known for, right? Uh, and I was amazed. 
I had two people turn it down because of other obligations, but there are some amazing artists who are involved in this, and there are also some people who are like younger artists. But, uh, so that was the one side, the other side was it just make, make it bold, and so they could do whatever they want. So you can see that it's, um, there are individual scripts that are integrated into there. You can see where the scenes are. And they're, they're about that big, right? Yeah. So they're working, they, they know what the overall is going to be. No, or no they didn't. They didn't know what the overall painting was going to require. I put little notches where significant lines would line up. But they, they had the photograph. But imagine, some of them, you know, like had nothing, essentially nothing on it. They were like, well, what am I painting? As opposed to the people who had the, the eyes. I, I was profoundly moved by some of the people. The, the woman who painted the mouth, she wrote me this long letter that sort of talked about her meditation. She's a phenomenal uh, portrait painter. But uh, she's also an oil painter. So for her to, to paint it was like adventure and something totally different. Uh, so that, that's investing a lot of trust in your collaborators. And also, um, you know, in terms of the meaning of this to you, I'm sure yeah. that it's changed as you were getting the submissions and you were figuring out how they were going to, how they fit together, looking at that. Um, you know, why did you want to do a composite photograph, or image of Tema using people that all knew her or just people that knew you? I would say maybe, <clears throat> maybe a quarter of the people that met Tema. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them knew her through my work. Um, I was interested in this idea of the broken body, right? Literally, in this case, broken into fragments that can be um, I'm also interested in this idea of I'm not a fan of Jeff Koons. If you don't know who Jeff Koons is, go look him up because he's probably one of the more better known artists of the 21st century. Koons actually has other people make his art. He does not make any of it. He also insists that they not give him any ideas if they try to, he fires them. So you have an artist who, it's entirely his idea and the production is entirely this century factory that makes his art. Um, that's actually fairly similar to film, for instance. I mean, there, there are other best presidents. I was not interested in that. I was interested in making something that was made by other people, but I was completely involved. It would not have happened with my other people. Sure. And there, there's just something, I had a conversation not long ago with a, a pretty famous realist painter, and I was telling him I had people work with me while making paintings, not just this kind of project, but actually assisting me. And he was like, what? How can you possibly do that? I don't let anybody stretch my canvases. And my response to him, which is sort of off the cuff, was, well, the work is bigger than me because of that. And he said, you mean bigger paintings? Well, sometimes yes, but actually it is literally bigger than I can make because I, within my own self, can only contribute so much to a work. So that's part of what's interesting to me about this, is that it's, it is bigger than me. And uh, again, I wanted to get this idea of sort of community to be sort of indirectly created by just the right. This idea that um, you know each one of us ha has a, has circles, overlapping circles. Sometimes the people in those circles don't necessarily even uh, see or meet or touch one another. But um, and you know our identities are as much reflected in those communities as much as how we shape them. Um, and then if those communities are really rich, uh, they are affecting our identities in some way and changing us. So um, it seems to me that that's one, <coughs> one possible metaphor for the way you've, you've initiated this kind of portrait of Tema. Yeah, yeah. It's also like a friendship quilt. Are you familiar with that tradition where a bunch of people contribute to making a quilt for some whiskey barrier or something? The backside especially. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing, also, you know, getting back to what I was saying at the beginning about your connections to artists who, who are thinking about this way of making images that, you know, they don't touch on or integrate traditional iconography, but by their very presence and by the form that they take are uh, echoing icons. For that's not so that's so very, very much what that's, that's about. Um, did you talk about this? Yeah, I talked to okay. How are we doing time-wise? About 10, about 10 minutes.
Um, so this is a self-portrait called Dust. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about self-portraiture in your work, in particular this painting, which is now on loan to the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, I, I rarely make self-portraits. To be honest, I'm not very interested in representing myself. Um, when my father died, I actually the painting, the to my earth, the big one that I said I used all the photographs to make, uh, which you see from above. This was made at the same time for the same exhibition. And there was also a companion painting of my wife, which was uh, called, it's, it's very dark, it's her at night, she wrote, uh, it's a Terra ter Luna. Yeah. And um, I was interested in the idea of making a, a self-portrait. To be honest, I don't remember what my actual idea is. When I look at it now, I think about imagining perhaps this is how Tim might perceive me, or the sort of perceiving someone through a memory. Uh, it, it feels like uh, it's not about um, a direct experience of the self, I guess. Why did you name it Dust? From Dust to the that was softball, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. This is exciting. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, like a review of this. I talked okay. about this too. Yeah. But you were talking about him. Right. Um, let's see. Okay, I didn't talk about this. Yeah, this has a particular. This is in Oxford. Yes, this is in Oxford. It's called the Oxford Tema. About three years ago, a group of students expressed interest in going to England. And so we went to England, but I, I, I connected with an artist, two artists who were in Oxford. One is the vicar of a church, a Episcopal church in, in Oxford, and the other is an artist who's very knowledgeable about, about Oxford. And I proposed that we would make this for the church. So the students and I were with the same guy, Dan Wahlberg, who made the, the woodwork for that 25 piece. He did the woodwork for this, which is frankly insane woodwork. He used nine different species of wood. There is no color in this painting other than the color of the wood it's painted on. Uh, so nine different species of wood, and it's like a puzzle block. It all fits together. Um, so wait a minute. So there's no color, but the color of the species of wood. So what? What pigment, what, where did you apply it? So it's just black and white. Just black and white. Just black and white. So the tone of the pillow behind her is right. the wood. Right. The, well, it's the wood, wood, that's maple. So it's a <coughs> of wood. The skin is cherry. Um, I can't tell you what all the different types of wood, but the, the, you, know, you know what a puzzle block? It's like a puzzle. He's doing these pieces, which might sound simple. It's insanely difficult. The wood is about uh, less than half an inch thick. Um, so, yes, all the students participated in working on this, members of the church participated in making this, and uh, I think I did all the painting on the hand, on the arms and the face, and I worked with other parts, but again, I was really interested in this idea, of, similarly to that one in terms of a community, a painting that literally is a kind of community in its sort of multi-partness. Does that make sense? We're almost out of time for this period. I wonder if we should open up to questions. Yeah, let's. let's do you have any questions? We'll keep jabbing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the uh, painting where you had like the parts you sent out to the, like 25 different artists, yeah. did, they, did you like tell them what to paint on the back of it, or did they no. just do that? No, I said just just make it gold. And I about that piece. I, I have actually shown this many times, and I don't say who made what, which is a weird thing, but I'm kind of thinking about the Middle Ages where we had guilds that would make things, and we don't know who actually made the thing. However, all the names will be listed whenever I show it, the names are listed. I'm going to break that rule with one person's name, uh, because to me it's pretty meaningful. The cloth on the right side, second one down, that's by an artist in Chicago named Steve Corelli. And Steve told me why he made this painting of cloth. He said, I grew up, he, his, his parents were Italian, and he grew up with his mother who spoke very little English. She was a seamstress, and so she had all this cloth around the house. So he grew up with cloth. So for his, he wanted to make Thomas gold made prom dress. Thomas never went to a prom. It was to me just a profoundly 
sweet thing to make. Um, and many of them are much more kind of neutral in terms of there's no particular image. But I had the sense that with all of them, they thought carefully about what they did with gold to, to make the piece. Um, yeah, another question. That that did answer your question, right? Yeah. Okay. Any, any other thoughts or responses? Questions about the show and the gallery? Do you have any since this gentleman's here? We probably will go over to the gallery afterwards. If any of you want to come over there and, and talk about it, chat about it, um, we'd be very happy to, to try and confuse you more than we can confuse you. Uh, let's see. Did you, if no one has a question, we'll keep saying stuff. <laughs> well, open our mouths and words will come out. <laughs> Hopefully, it kind of works. So, I've noticed that. Um, so, did you talk at all about um, the relationship between observational painting versus painting photographs and whether you, what determines whether you're going to rely on one or the other? Or do you always rely on one? Well, I did talk about the phenomena of, of photography and this painting in terms of zooming the lens to get that, that phenomenon. Um, I largely work from photographs, in part because I like to take photographs, but mainly because the subject, being Tama, it would be quite difficult. I couldn't ask her to not move. She, I have no control over what she does. I had, on one occasion, I made a series of seven drawings. Each drawing took a week to make, and those actually were drawn from life. That was, that was highly unusual. Um, Plus, I'm always interested, I'm, I'm not interested in a photograph as a staged thing for the most part, which I'm, this sounds contradictory to what I should talk about in relation to Tim on Earth, to call them those different photographs. Typically, I'm interested in, this, this is something done where I can't really control it by zooming, just sort of moving the camera around. I'm not actually like carefully attending to framing a photograph. I'm just making a photograph, and later, one out of a hundred of those, I look and think, that's really interesting. And part of the interest for me is that I didn't make it. it. Does that make sense? It's not something I intentionally, I'm not that good of a photographer. I, mean, I take lots of photographs, but I'm not the sort of photographer that I'm interested in making. I'm making this image now for you to see. Like Andrew. Uh, what's his name? Yeah. 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 Landscape photographer. Did you say Andrew? Yeah. Uh, uh, What's his name? Ansel Adams. Yeah, Ansel Adams. Very carefully, everything is like very carefully attended to. Um, long exposures. Yeah, long exposures. I, so yeah, that's, it's a, it's a little bit of it. Um, I'm interested in sort of the irony of painting as a very, very, very slow practice in comparison to a photograph like this, which took that much time to make, right? But there, there's an intention behind um, you know, leaving those those traces and the, the accidents that happen through the technology, um, which is, you're embracing what's imprecise about it. It can be accidental, what can be, uh, maybe in some people's opinions, not a good photograph. Exactly. And then you are, re you are translating that through the slow process of painting. So those traces and those out of focus areas must be meaningful in some way. Yeah, they are not about, yeah. Like, why, why these accidents are okay to paint in here versus something else? You know, does this get to something that you feel is meaningful to the body or to portraiture in some way? Yeah, to be honest, I don't think of them as portraits. Um, portraiture to me is something where you're getting a record of a person as simply the record of the person. Very rarely when I make an image of Tema or otherwise, am I really interested in that? I'm interested in sort of the phenomenon of being, which may sound utterly vague, but I am interested in, in how painting, painting plays with the idea of being in really interesting ways, both as something you perceive and imagine, and as something that's made and is real. Um, painting is an utterly, utterly mysterious act. If you ever have a chance to pursue painting in some fashion, I would encourage you, because something happens in the making of painting that doesn't happen in anything else I experience in life. You make this choice, 
and then you make this choice, and suddenly you have a totally different painting. You make this choice, and you suddenly have a different thing. And so I'm interested in painting as sort of a phenomenon of making, making something that's a sort of co complex web of stuff, and then having that thing actually be a representational thing. And then that complicated by you know, the blur. So it's, it's really wanting to sort of bring people to a kind of uh, awareness of different kinds of being and different ways of 